There we go. Here we are. Okay. Folks are starting to come in, Adam, Peter. Yes. Good evening. Welcome to this, I guess it's a January edition of the Voices of Saanich. Uh, I'm Adam Olson. I'm the MLA for Saanich North and the Islands. We've got Tex McLeod, who is our, uh, what, what title should we give you, Tex? Convener of the Voices of Saanich. Or coordinator or convener. I can be either one of those, Adam. All right. And we've got Peter Wainwright, who's our guest uh, this evening. So we're just going to let uh, time for people to settle in, join us. We've got a, um, a good conversation tonight, I think, uh, lined up about the housing legislation and uh, the potential changes that could come uh, from that legislation that was uh, passed last fall. And uh, looking forward to Peter's presentation and a little conversation that we'll have and to, uh, to also uh, questions and answers later on this, this evening. And Adam, Peter is saying that all of the municipalities in the area, Central Saanich, Sydney, North Saanich, all of them are having staff reports. And Peter is often uh, showing up at these meetings and now sharing his information. Um, so uh, so this is, we are very, very timely on this one. So let me just clarify on that. Um, North Saanich has yet, uh, to uh, um, have this on their agenda. It, it's Sydney and Central Saanich that did. And I'm not actually presenting to the council meetings. Um, I'm presenting, uh, or I'm part of a panel discussion that's coming up on Sunday that Radio Sydney and the Sydney Community Association are doing. And the North Saanich Residents Association has invited me to their meeting on February 7th, which is again going to be about the housing legislation with a North Saanich focus. Um, so, you know, I, I'm quite in, um, quite happy to share the, uh, the work that uh, we've been doing, looking into uh, the legislation, the background, the issues and so on, but it, it's a, an evolving topic. So there's going to be more to come. Well, I think that as we will as we will unpack, or as uh, Peter will help us unpack this evening, um, one of the challenges with understanding this legislation when it was at the debate uh, stage was exactly how it was going to apply uh, across the eighty five communities that uh, it applied that that uh, it applies in, or at least that they are targeting. So. Um, this is good work, uh, good service being done by Peter this evening, and, and there's distinctions uh, that between the three municipalities on the Saanich Peninsula. The, the very the impacts will vary, and so and across the capital region uh, even as well. So um, much more to to uh, learn about this. Uh, Tex, do you want to maybe uh, get the yeah. evening started? We've got underway here. Yes, let's do that. So. Um... Let me just uh, welcome everyone to our, our uh, Voices of Saanich and the Islands tonight with our special guest, Peter Wainwright. Peter does a public affairs show at Radio Sydney, which is our local internet radio station. Uh, he'll tell us a little bit more about how that works. And uh, we are very fortunate to have Peter tonight because Peter has been a municipal councillor in Sydney for many years and has uh, become a student of this, these regulations and uh, the changes that they're going to bring. So he's here to share that with us, which is pretty wonderful. I'd like to take a moment as we get started to recognize that we're on the traditional territories of the Wasanich people. We share this beautiful, beautiful part of the world and uh, we're very grateful to, uh, to be a part of it and we're very willing to take on up what we need to do to help maintain and look after this part of the world uh, as Adam reminds us. So um, with that what I'd like to do is turn it over to Adam and thank you very much once again for joining us. Adam over to you. Thank you. Yeah thank you Tex and uh, thank you for convening uh, these uh, really important conversations. 
And uh, thank you to Peter w Wainwright for being our guest this evening. And welcome uh, to this uh, to this episode of, uh, of Voices of Saanich, uh, and featuring a conversation about, about the housing legislation that was passed last fall. Uh, if you receive my newsletter or if you happen to view my check out my website last fall, you might have seen uh, me lighting my hair on fire about uh, the way that these bills were brought in um, and uh, democracy on a couple of levels. Um, and I don't have much hair to, to light on fire. I think that was this, the smirk that Peter gave me there. But um, yeah, I was uh, I was quite disturbed at uh the level of discourse that was allowed uh, during this, during this, these important changes, um, or the changes that uh, that have been made in, in zoning across the province, it's probably the, the single largest um, zoning change uh, in 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 recent history in, uh, in in the province of British Columbia, and it will impact communities about eighty five communities across the province. Um, I would raise a lot of concerns about uh, the lack of debate, the lack of awareness, the lack of uh, ability for people to really understand what the potential impacts on their communities and in their local democracies. And I raised some concerns uh, specifically to the bills over about a two week period. Anyhow, um, that's now passed us. Uh, the bills uh, were passed. A couple of them, uh, I think, were we, the government used closure to shut down debate and use their majority to pass the bills. Uh, and uh, a couple of them passed because of uh, they got through to the end of the debate. Either way, all of the bills have been passed and they've been regulated now. The regulations have been passed in early December, about seven days later. And so we're not talking about the hypothetical impacts of British, on British Columbians. We're talking about the real uh, impacts and starting to understand how those impacts will play out uh, in our communities. Tonight we'll take a, a broad look at it, and I think that Peter's going to. We'll turn it over to Peter Wainwright here in a in a, in a minute uh, to walk us through a presentation, and then perhaps Peter, uh, you and I can have a, a brief conversation about this, and then and then entertain some questions from the uh, the community here that's joined us uh, online. So I invite people to put your questions in the, in the Q and A. I see a couple of them there already. And uh, I'll keep an eye on that as we go. And um, I uh, barely made it here on time. There, there was an incident uh, in downtown Victoria and slowed my bus travel, uh, my transit travel home. So I'm going to turn my camera off when Peter's doing his presentation and eat my dinner. And hopefully I'll have wiped my face and off and <laughs> we'll be ready for some questions when the presentation's done. It's really a joy to invite Peter to the uh, com to lead the conversation this evening and to inform this dis this discussion. Uh, as a longtime member of uh, Sydney Council, it was what over twenty years, Peter, that you were a member of Sydney Council. Very experienced, uh, both uh, at the council table and and uh, looking at these uh, these issues at a regional and at a provincial level. Uh, Peter brings a, a lot of uh, understanding of the Local Government Act land use planning and zoning bylaws and uh, and the local government process and so it's it's wonderful that you've uh, done the technical work i've had the benefit uh, of being interviewed you by you on your uh, peninsula affairs show on on radio sydney where we've engaged in these uh, housing debates over the last couple of uh, conversations that we've had and so this uh, will likely be some kind of an extension of that uh, Peter is now retired from local government politics, so you've got some time to look at this technical work. Maybe I'll leave uh, some of the details to you to explain what you're up to these days, Peter. But I'll turn it over to you now to provide uh, uh, your presentation, and we'll take it from there. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, so you can, I've got the presentation up there, and we should be able to get going through here. So. Um, I'm actually going to go through things, uh, I guess, fairly quickly on on some of the stuff. I'm not going to talk about Radio Sydney or some of the other background things because there's actually a ton of stuff to cover, and um, I don't want to get sidetracked. So that's enough. Well, the only thing I'm going to say about the opening slide, 
Um, I'm actually talking about, I'm going to talk about the entire Saanich and the Gulf Islands, even though I confess that I tend to focus on the peninsula. So I, I am prepared to, you know, deal with um, what about uh, the Islands Trust and all that kind of stuff. So to the meat. So the three pieces of legislation that we're, I'm going to be talking about tonight are Bill 44, which is the residential development one. It's the one that um, changed the single family zoning and has uh, changed the, uh, the, the way that um, residential development approvals happen. Bill 46 is about development financing and it's specifically about um, development cost charges and uh, amenity contributions. And Bill 47 is the transit oriented areas one with the theory being that you should um, put more housing density immediately around the, the important transit hubs and the province um, stepping in to make that happen. So first one to look at is Bill 44. And this is the one that makes the changes to the single family zones. And I think everybody's heard about this. So with respect to the single family zones, it's not, um, not precisely single family zone. It's any kind of zone that existed in November that allows a single family detached home or a duplex, okay? So there are a lot of zones that are very close to that that might not be called single family. And yes, they are captured by this set of changes. So the first change, and, and you've heard some of this stuff on the news, is that secondary suites and or accessory dwelling units are basically allowed province-wide in a single family zone. Now this isn't, um, there are some exceptions, but if you're not on municipally operated sewer, you're not allowed to do the accessory dwelling unit. It's only a secondary suite. And this also does not apply if the, the lot is um, greater than, uh, you can only do this that if you're on a lot greater than one hectare. Now, an important bit of the fine print is the asterisk, which is down at the bottom. If you're in a local trust area per the Islands Trust Act, this does not apply. So that is in fact um, Salt Spring, it's Pender, it's Saturna. If you're in the Island Trust area, this does not apply. The last exemption I've got down there is a bit of a technicality. If you're in a municipality that adopted a land, a rural land use bylaw, under the provisions of section 886, which was only in the Local Government Act in 1996 to 2000, then that is considered equivalent. <laughs> and, and again, it doesn't apply. That's probably not relevant to us um, in the Saanich and the Gulf Islands. So the, I guess the key thing on that one, the secondary suite or the accessory dwelling unit in any single family zone, that would be basically the peninsula, but it, only in an area where you've got municipal sewer. So that's gonna rule out quite a lot of the areas of North Saanich and some of central Saanich. That comes into effect on July 1st, even though the bill's already passed. The next thing I think people heard about is that, um, on any single family lot, you're gonna be allowed three, four or six units, depending on the size of the lot and how close you are to a, a bus stop with frequent service. So the details on this are, if you're in a municipality with more than 5,000 people and you're inside the urban containment boundary, if it's a single family lot, less than or equal to 280 square meters, you can have three units. If it's more than 280, you can have four. Again, this is only in municipalities with more than 5,000 people 
and only within the urban containment boundary. Okay, all of North Saanich is outside the urban containment boundary. All of Sydney is within the urban containment boundary. Central Saanich, some is in, some is out. And um, none of this would apply to the Islands Trust. Uh, and for the Saanich part of our, um, of Saanich and Gulf Islands, um, it's going to be based on lot size and whether you're in the urban containment boundary. I think it all is, but I'm not that familiar. So this stuff kicks in on July 1st. There's also been, uh, it, there's the possibility of six units being permitted. And the details on that one are, it's got to be a lot bigger than 280 square meters, and you have to be within 400 meters of a bus stop served by at least one route that stops every 15 minutes between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Friday. Again, municipalities over and within the urban containment boundary. And as a nicety, you're not allowed to impose parking requirements. Important thing here is we don't have any bus routes that have service stopping every 15 minutes, not anywhere in Saanich and Gulf Islands. So this is um, doesn't apply to us unless our transit service improves quite a lot. Okay, um, one thing I should say, if people are trying to take notes, don't because um, you can have a copy of the slide deck and uh, I know this is pretty information dense, so it'll be a lot easier to look at it maybe afterwards. Let's move on. So a key thing was that 280 square meters. So like, what is that? So 280 square meters is 20 meters by 14 meters if it's a rectangle. I mean, there are other ways you can get that, but for, for perspective, that is roughly 66 feet by 46 feet. And that's um, pretty small. That's uh, uh, less than a 14th of an acre. Um, so if you're smaller than that, you're only allowed to do three units. And if you're more than that, you're allowed to do four. So, um, Almost every single family lot in Sydney, with the exception of the ones that are considered um, small lot high density, are more than 280. So that would be like four units pretty much anywhere. And the interesting thing about the way it works is that um, if, if you're not in the development permit area now, and, and if you don't need a variance, uh, starting July 1st, uh, the zoning is in effect, and all you have to do is apply for a building permit. That's it. No rezoning, it's not getting reviewed by um, advisory planning, whatever. Um, so that's how that'll roll out. Key thing is that 280 square meters is actually pretty small. Um, so you, you, if you live in a single family detached, you should kind of think about how, what does that mean in relation to your law? Are you above the threshold or no? Okay, this was only part of it. Um, everybody was really interested in what you're allowed to do on single family in terms of density, three unit, four unit, six unit, that kind of thing. But um, okay. the other details here that I, I should go through are the exemptions. So, this three to six unit thing, if you're not served by municipal sewer and water, that doesn't apply. So no increase in density unless you're on municipally operated sewer and water. It's not good enough if it's privately operated sewer. It's actually got to be operated by a municipality or a regional district. Next one probably doesn't matter. Um, if your lot's bigger than 4,000 square meters, this doesn't apply. If you've got a heritage designation on it or a heritage agreement, that's still valid. So that may impact um, whether you can do the three to six units. If you are in a development permit area to protect from hazardous conditions, and that would be something like 
unstable slopes, um, floodplain, that kind of thing, per that particular section of the Go Local Government Act. Um, to the extent that um, the protections are necessary, uh, you can't do the three to six. So if an engineer looks at it and says, yeah, you can do six, it, it doesn't affect the hazard, then you can do six. But it's not an automatic. The development permit area is still there. Now, we get interesting when we start talking about development permit areas for other reasons, and particularly environmentally sensitive areas. And the way this reads is that those um, environmentally sensitive area and development permit area guidelines would still apply provided this does, using that authority does not unreasonably obstruct the intent of this legislation. So they're basically saying you can do it um, if there is a legitimate um, and you're not being unreasonable trying to obstruct the extra density. Another point is that provincial legislation like ALR continues to apply, and that would also be Riparian Protection Act, Drinking Water Protection Act, or a few other ones that may impact whether you can do three, four, or whatever on that single family lot. And the last thing to keep in mind is that if you've got any covenants or easements or other charges registered on title, they're still there. And interestingly, um, the town of Sydney has, in fact, um, registered covenants on a lot of the small lots where they approved uh, a development permit for form and character. They actually registered the plans as a covenant on title for some of them. So that's not always the case. And I, Sydney, I'm sure, has not done it consistently. But one also has to look and make sure there isn't stuff like that um, on the title, because that can affect things. OK, now I'm out of the what they did to the single family lot stuff. The next thing that Bill 44 did, and probably more significant, is they changed the process of how um, residential developments are approved. So the first thing effective immediately is that public hearings are no longer allowed for residential developments that are consistent with the official community plan. And there's some other process changes as well. And in fact, um, on Monday night, uh, Sydney Council had a zoning amendment that was consistent with the official community plan. There was no public hearing and it went from first reading to final adoption the same night. So you snooze, you lose on that one. There was an opportunity for public comment or, or whatever, but not a public hearing, not advertised as a public hearing, and it was over and done the same night. So if you weren't aware of that, well, it's too late. The next big thing is um, there's a requirement for each municipality to update their zoning bylaw to implement these small scale multi-unit housing changes. And those changes to the, to the municipal zoning bylaw have to be done by June 30th this year. So the clock is ticking. There's less than six months to get that done. And these are the changes to single family zone to implement the three units, four units, six unit kind of thing. That's what they're talking about here. And the secondary suites, wherever that's relevant. The next thing they're requiring is that each municipality must update their housing needs report using a provincial methodology that's going to be released. And a key difference between what was done previously and what they're going to be requiring is what was done previously looked five years ahead. They're requiring this to be a 20-year projection. Now, this updated housing needs report has to be done by January 1st of next year. So again, the clock is ticking. It's gotta be done by the end of December and they have not yet released the methodology that the municipalities need to use. Then 
when you've got that housing needs report done, you're required to update your OCP to provide the forecasted 20 year housing supply per your housing needs um, report. And you must have that done by the end of next year, 2025. But we don't know what that methodology is yet and, and exactly what that's gonna mean, but there's your timeline. You've gotta get that OCP update done to provide that necessary amount of housing. And then you have to update your zoning bylaw to pre-zone all the areas to match your OCP. And that also has to be done by the end of next year. So those are some pretty significant um, deadlines that municipalities have to comply with. The extent to which you have to implement the single family stuff really determines how much work you've got to get done by the end of June. Okay. And just a couple of pictures, don't even try to read them. Um, these were in the Peninsula News Review. You're already starting to see notices and changes happening. So that was the one on the, the left is the notice of that zoning bylaw amendment that was consistent with the official community plan. No public hearing over and done that night. Okay, now I'm on to um, Bill 46, which is the development financing uh, one. And um, this is in effect now, um, but it's going to take a while for it to actually get implemented um, by the municipalities. So you don't know what development cost charges are. Um, they're a tool that local governments can use so that growth pays for the in infrastructure required to service the growth rather than current taxpayers. So what they do is they take the official community plan, they look at how much growth is allowed for in the community plan. An engineer looks at how, do, how much do we have to upgrade the infrastructure to, to service that growth. Then they go, how much will that cost? And then they figure out what's a fair charge for each unit of development uh, to contribute towards that amount. Um, on a positive note, Bill 46 expands the scope of infrastructure that can be funded like that. And um, a nicety, for example, is it used to be that you could not use DCCs to fund the municipal share of some highway infrastructure project, like a roundabout for Amazon, uh, or, or I should say growth in that general area. Um, now it is actually uh, under this new one, it's possible to uh, use DCCs to help pay for that, which is kind of appealing. They've also um, come up with a new tool they call amenity cost charges. And that is a tool that local governments can use replacing community amenity contributions. So this is, you, you don't negotiate it while the development is under approval. You figure it out all in, in advance in a bylaw and off you go and you can do it. Um, and that's effective now. So, um, Consequences of these are that there are some changes that um, are going to mean that local governments will need to review their amenity contribution policies and references to amenities in their zoning bylaw and OCP. This is kind of discretionary when they want to do it, but um, they've got to make these changes if they want to use kind of the new tools and uh, it's a pretty lengthy process to actually implement that. I don't think I need to say anything more about this. Um, I don't think people are too focused on this, but it it is pretty important stuff um, overall for the municipalities. Okay, on to Bill 47, the transit-oriented areas one. So this one is the one where, um, you know, the idea is to put the density around the transit stations. So what they've done is transit oriented areas or TOAs are defined in a regulation and they are areas that are within 800 meters from a, the top tier of transit hub, which happens to be SkyTrain stations, or they're within 400 meters of the next three tiers, 
which are bus exchanges, West Coast Express stations, and bus stops that are prescribed in the re regulations. Okay, so the regulations are in their two orders of council. Those are the magic numbers. They designate 52 transit oriented areas. So those are designated, they're there now. And what I can say is there are no bus stops prescribed in the regulations at all. And there are no transit oriented areas in the regulations on the Saanich Peninsula or the Gulf Islands or anywhere in the Saanich and Gulf Islands riding. The nearest TOA is the Uptown Exchange in Saanich, okay? Now, just for the sake of completing the conversation, the obligations that a local government, your municipality has, if you've got one of these TOAs, is you've got to allow the minimum levels of density, size, and dimensions that are specified in the regulations. I'll show you those. You've got to remove the parking requirements for off-street residential, except for disabled. So you can have parking requirements for commercial if it's mixed use, and you can have parking requirements for disabled, but the developer figures out how much parking is gonna be provided, if any, for the residential units. Now, um, there's another uh, thing in here that says, the municipality must consider the guidance and details in the provincial policy manual when planning or amending zoning bylaws. Now, um, th that uh, we'd have to drill down pretty deep to go through that, and there's really no point because, as I said, there are no TOAs anywhere um, in our riding. Okay, another important detail if the part of if a parcel is partly within that magic radius, it's considered wholly within. That's actually in the regulation, not discretion. And there are a few exemptions to this thing. So if, um, if the land is zoned for industrial or agricultural use and it's within the TOA, it's exempt. If it's ALR, it's exempt. Floodplains, hazard areas, ESAs, heritage designations, all those kinds of things, still have an effect. Okay, now um, let's go into the details a bit. So there are four tiers of these transit facilities with the top tier being the, si the sky trains. And I mentioned that it was up to 800 meters. There are three distances, the first 200 meters, the next 200 meters, then the 400 after it. And if you're within the first 200 meters, you're required to allow a minimum floor area ratio of 5.0 and a minimum number of stories that's allowed is 20. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but floor area ratio mean of 5.0 means that the total floor area can be five times the area of the parcel, okay? And I know this is hard to visualize, so an important thing I'm gonna say is if you look at Sydney's zoning bylaw for the downtown commercial zone, it allows 3.0 FAR and up to four stories. So if a four story development is allowed to have three times the floor area of the parcel, you kind of think that a 20 story development would be a little more than, it's not even twice. And that kind of ripples through farther down. Um, but I'm not, I won't dwell on this stuff. If you're near a SkyTrain, you could be up to 20. If you're near a West Coast Exchange one, you could be up to 12 stories. If you're near, if you're within 200 meters of up-down, you could be up to 10. And if you're one of these tier four things that is yet to be defined, it might be up to six. But that six, would actually have a minimum allowed floor area ratio less than what they would allow in Sydney's downtown core. Wow, that looks well thought out. Anyway, uh, moving on. Um, that's what Uptown looks like. So there's the Uptown Exchange. This is generally Uptown. That's 200 meters. This is 400 meters. I don't know if people can see my little arrow, but off on the 
the side here, this general area is all single family. So what they've done is they've just said, you know, X number of stories throughout this. And looking at it, as I said, any parcel that's partly in is considered wholly within. So that's wholly within. This parcel that is barely in the radius is wholly within, with about 90% of it actually lying outside. Um, anyway, that's what it looks like. So um, the last thing that I should do in the overview kind of side of it is this is what the timeline looks like if I put all that stuff together. So you can kind of see how it plays out. So effective now, um, public hearings are no longer re allowed for residential developments consistent with the OCP. The transit oriented areas are in effect. They've been designated, those um, zoning changes are, are alive. And the development cost charge stuff has is there, it's also in effect, but not really until the municipalities implement it. Now, there was an interesting thing that was on the, the provincial web page that got deleted, and then they actually made the announcement. So they have actually announced that they're distributing $51 million to local governments to help deal with the cost of doing this stuff. And um, the three peninsula municipalities have been told they're each getting a little over $200,000 uh, to do that. And that's supposed to happen sometime this month. According to their, their media releases and their webpage, the housing needs report methodology is going to be released, quote, early 2024. Um, okay, so we're kind of here in the timeline waiting for them to release that. The municipalities have this task of reviewing their amenity contribution policies and deciding if they're going to adopt the uh, amenity cost charge bylaw that totally up to them where they fit that in so that is a discretionary kind of thing we've also been told that guidance is going to be provided to the municipalities for the updating of the ocps and the zoning bylaws that are going to be required at the end of 20, um, 2025 okay Next one, I mentioned that these uh, single family zoning changes have to be uh, brought into effect. The zoning bylaw must be updated to include those by June 30th, you know, less than six months away. Now, um, the municipalities are required also to designate those TOD areas in their zoning bylaw if they have one within their municipality. And they also have to have made the necessary adjustments to remove the parking requirements. We don't have the need to do that currently, but if, if somebody suddenly decided we needed to, that would have to get done by June 30th, okay? And on July 1st, those changes to the single family zoning come into effect. And I've mentioned that um, You've got a deadline to update your housing needs report. That's January 1st of next year. And then December 31st, you've got to have updated your OCP to provide the 20 year housing supply that you forecast. And you've got to update your zoning bylaw to rezone to match what's in your OCP. Okay. At this point, I've actually covered sort of the overview of what's in the legislation. I could do a bit more of a deep dive, like there's exemptions and some other details and stuff, but there's really not a lot of point, particularly on the ones that don't apply to us. There are, however, some concerns um, about the legislation overall and what's coming down the pipe that I would like to raise. And um, I'm, I'm not gonna kind of focus on was this legislation the right thing to do or or stuff like that but rather um peninsula perspective on uh, on some concerns um pers perspectives of having been in local government for a while and things that maybe we've learned to try to avoid 
Um, so let me just get into this. So the first thing up is that uh, one of the things you learn in, in local government is that um, development rights are very expensive to take away. So if we make a mistake and we give somebody zoning that lets them have development rights that we decide weren't appropriate, we do have the power to take it away, but the courts make it very clear that we have to compensate when we do that. So um, whenever you're uncertain about whether this is the right thing to do or not, it tends to make sense to go slow and uh, be cautious about how you implement it. So um, the development rights that are associated with these transit-oriented areas, already there. If that gave you um, a zone, you know, a, a windfall, Mr. Developer, okay, you know, it would be really expensive to claw that back. Interesting thing though, is the development rights that are associated with the changes to single family zones aren't in effect till July 1st. So there is in fact time to tweak those without it being expensive. You're not taking development rights away. Um, so should we do something like that? Should we have a hard look? I mean, obviously we put a lot of thought into this. We don't make mistakes. So here we are looking at the um, Columbia Station uh, transit oriented area. Uh, this is in one of the regulations. This is in the city of New Westminster. And you can see my little arrow pointing to a parcel that I'm highlighting in blue, which is in Surrey. Um, and it's falling within that 800 meter radius, but um, gee, that's the Fraser River that you're gonna have to walk across. Don't think you can bicycle there. And in fact, um, it, it'll be well over twice that distance if you wanna try to get there on a bicycle, for example. Like this is no, in no way is that within 800 meters of that transit station. Now to make life better, that parcel is barely within the radius. There are a few other words around it that are partly in it, but if you're partly in, you're all in, right? So that parcel, unless it has some exemption because it's industrial or whatever, um, just picked up that full set of development rights. Okay, so um, the concerns I'd like to raise um, First about the Bill 44 one is um, this housing needs report. We're expecting that methodology to come out sometime soon. And the municipalities are gonna have to use that methodology to forecast a 20 year housing supply, which they then have to provide that amount of housing in their OCP and pre-zone to match it. And there's a lot of scope to this. Like um, the methodology hopefully will be similar to what was done be, you know, previously in the housing needs assessment, but um, they are going to be specifying methodology. They're probably going to be specifying the data sources to use. And will that housing supply simply be a number of units or are they going to go, you need this much residential you need this much non-market and, and that sort of thing. So we really do not have any idea um, what the consequences of that are gonna be. And we're not gonna be able to evaluate that until we actually see that methodology that you know we're expecting soon. So that, that's one of the concerns. Um, we'd really like to see that methodology and it's quite possible that the impact of that will be very significant. I suspect in the case of town of Sydney, with a lot of the single family having the potential to go four unit because of the single family change, that will provide a lot of potential housing supply that may mitigate the impact on Sydney. But in North Saanich, with none of those changes applying, they're going to have to figure out how to modify their OCP to provide whatever that 20 year projection is. And that could be a significant um, change to the OCP. So this is, you know, again, I'm, I'm talking kind of big picture concerns. Okay. 
Next one is um, the importance of transit plans. So reading the regulations, um, the, this allowance for six units on a parcel, it's not when the bus stop is there, it's when the bus stop is planned. So when if they come up with a transit plan, which is indicating an improvement in service at, in the future, that's going to provide that at least 15 minute level, that is the trigger for the six unit happening in single family. Um, wow. So um, we're going to want to watch very carefully uh, the development of, of uh, the transit plans for our region because they have implications. That particular six unit trigger would not apply in North Saanich because you're outside the urban containment boundary. It would apply in Sydney. It would apply in whatever parts of uh, central Saanich are within the urban containment boundary. When a transit plan comes out that says there's gonna be that kind of service, okay? Now, um, here we go with another thing that's in Bill 44. And this one is um, not too subtle, but the wording is, is maybe complicated. Section 457.1, the following powers must not be exercised in a manner that unreasonably prohibits or restricts the use or density of use required to be permitted by Da, 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 all the stuff in Bill 44. And then they give us a list of the powers that you can't use. And the first two are Section 488, which is development permit areas. And the second one, wow, land use regulation by zoning bylaw, OCP, like everything, and land use permits. Um, so basically what they're saying is, uh, hi, Municipal Council, you can't unreasonably restrict the density that Bill 44 says, period. And um, at Sydney Council uh, last night, one of the councillors asked, well, who decides whether that, you know, what's unreasonably restricting? Um, so the simple answer to that is, well, the province can make that decision anytime they want. And in fact, they've released a policy manual where they give an indication of what they think is reasonable and what's not reasonable. And uh, I guess the other thing though, that maybe is a bit worse than that is if I'm a property owner and I think my municipality is being unreasonable about what I can do on my waterfront property, I'm going to file for judicial review that they're being unreasonable about prohibiting uh, the density that I'm allowed. And that fights between the developer and the municipality. The province is not involved at all. And um, gee, my experience as a municipal councillor is we're really reluctant to get into that kind of fight. The courts often um, side with the property owner and they often have deep pockets. Okay, so that's simply a concern about um, not sure how this one's going to play out. Sydney, for example, has a lot of these small lot uh, areas that are in fact development permit areas for form and character. And because of that, you have to apply for the development permit and you get referred to the advisory planning commission and the process for approving the development takes longer, which the province thinks is unreasonable. And that's kind of in their policy manual. Um, it's quite possible that they will come out with some additional clarification and say in their guidance for your zoning bylaw that thou shalt remove the form and character DP areas. So waiting to see what happens from that one. And then uh, related um, is um, the question about areas expected to be frequently inundated to, due to sea level rise. Now these would, um, typically be considered uh, or, or may reasonably be considered a development permit area because of the, the flooding hazard. Um, so the, 
the previous thing about not being unreasonable does in fact apply, but you're doing it to protect from a hazard. So you, you do have some wiggle room here, but you're only able to um, exempt the property from, from uh, the additional density if you've got a qualified professional certifying that increasing the density would significantly increase the threat or risk from the ha hazardous condition. Well, you know, more people living in the area that's going to be inundated, more, you know, um, valued property. Yeah, you can argue that increases the risk, no problem. But then it goes, the threat or risk from the hazardous condition cannot be practically mitigated. Okay, well, it's pretty easy to build a seawall. Even if the municipality doesn't want you to, um, obviously that condition can be practically mitigated. So that basically blocks you from um, trying to exempt those areas. And here, uh, what I really am seeing kind of as an issue here is that um, we know that we're gonna have to do regional or sub-regional planning to deal with uh, sea level rise. Like you can't have a seawall and then a gap and then another seawall and expect things to work. Um, you, you've got to take a coordinated approach to this. But what they've done is they've basically set it up so that waterfront property owners have got this set of rights associated with Bill 44 that look like you can't really block them. And they could really be a barrier to a coordinated approach to dealing with that in an area like Roberts Bay, for example, or CM Harbor or whatever. So it, it seems to me that um, the better approach would have been to say, look, um, there's a risk of doing this and maybe we should not do it in phase one. Maybe we should see how the rest of the stuff works out, do a little more consultation on this one, and decide later whether we want to bring it in. Because it's easy to add it in later. It's expensive to try to take it away if you decide that it was a mistake. And I think on this one, um, my big concern is not to do with the density at all. It's simply about the need for... Um, removing barriers to regional approaches to managing sea level rise because it, it's going to be necessary to have a coordinated approach to it okay i'm done on bill 44 i actually have no concerns about bill 46 at least nothing of substance that i would bring up bill 47 that transit oriented areas one i'm going to circle back to that in transit plans we know that at some point in the future, the peninsula is going to need a transit facility and better transit service. And we're going to qualify for that lowest tier in the in the transit oriented areas. Don't know when that's going to happen, but it, it's kind of inevitable. And so the thing that you recognize from this, though, is that community engagement and peninsula involvement in those transit plans is going to, going to be critical because those transit plans are also going to dictate land use plans, right? So that, that's a pretty significant thing that every municipality is going to be interested in. So for example, what would North Sandwich feel if they um, decide they're going to designate um, McTavish Exchange as a tier four? That would have some pretty big implications because nothing has, you know, nothing in Bill 44 is applying to them. But this thing suddenly would. And a particular issue here, given how critically important it is for the municipalities all to be involved in that kind of planning stuff, is they're not. Um, currently, and this is per the BC Transit Act, the peninsula has one seat on the Victoria Regional Transit Commission, which is the one that does these transit plans. That seat rotates among the peninsula mayors. It's currently Mayor Windsor. He's doing a wonderful job. I, you know, kudos to him and all that. But there's a governance principle here that um, every municipality should have a voice because 
suddenly this stuff is really important. That's actually it on Bill 47. Okay. Last thing is um, some concerns about this overall timeline that I went through. And I've I kind of I tried to remove any of the fluff here. So we've got stuff that's in effect now. We're waiting for that housing needs report methodology to come out. We're hoping it's going to come out soon. The zoning bylaws got to get updated to um, incorporate this Bill of 44 stuff by June 30th. Um, those changes come into effect July 1st. The housing needs report has to be done by January 1st. And then you've got to get your OCP update, including that 20 year forecast and update your zoning bylaw by December 31st. So we're, there is quite a lot of stuff that municipalities need to get done. And of course, this is not the only stuff on their plate. A big concern is, um, <laughs> so <laughs> 13 municipalities in the CRD are gonna update their OCPs all in, in the same year. And um, they're all going to have to submit those. Uh, each municipality is gonna have to submit that OCP for review to CRD. They've got to approve it under the regional growth strategy. And it's also got to be approved by adjacent municipalities, First Nations, and there's quite a bit of consultation stuff involved. But the bottleneck we've seen in the past is CRD because they literally take months to process one OCP amendment through um, CRD board. So what happens when they're trying to do 13? Okay, that doesn't look pretty. Um, I guess that really is, the overall concern is just the amount of stuff coming down the pipe and the load it's putting on um, our local governments, their ability to handle this stuff. At the Sydney Council meeting on Monday night, um, the staff report indicated that it was a significant workload. It was gonna modify the zoning bylaw update they had in process. They were gonna to have to reduce the amount of public consultation they had planned to be able to essentially meet the deadlines. Now, anything beyond July 1st is speculative because we don't even know what the methodology is going to be. But um, anyone who needs a consultant to help them prepare their housing needs report, there's a limited pool of consultants in the province that do that kind of stuff. And every municipality looking for help is going to be wanting the same pool of consultants. And the same thing is true of a lot of other pieces of this. So um, there could be quite a bit of competition uh, for the, the consultants and professionals they're gonna need to help roll this out. So I guess there's a concern um, that this is going to be, um, how do you say, uh, efficient, timely, smooth process. But anyway, that's where that is. So um, that's it on the timeline, that's it on the concerns. Um, I'll show you my next slide. This is for reference only. This is literally every piece of legislation that's relevant in the orders of the council and the policy manuals. And if you ask for a copy of the slide deck, you've got all that and um, that's it. So uh, Adam. Yeah, that's it, just, just that. Yeah, un unfortunately, I guess the, the big overall message is um, still waiting for the shoe to drop. Um, have a good idea um, what the municipalities need to do in the next six months, but it's pretty speculative beyond there. And, and it's possible that um, there are going to be some new announcements that um, change that. Yeah. Um, it is uh, a lot, as I think uh, people are probably feeling from uh, from your presentation, Peter. First, um, you want to maybe stop sharing your screen there. We can sure. 
Actually, do you want me to leave it there in case I have to go back to one or I'll pull it up if we need Oh, to. yeah. Okay, sure. Sure. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot to digest. It was a lot to digest uh, the, the way that it was brought out. I think we, we had about a, a week and a half to look through multiple pieces of legislation and but you know and and it, it took everything we had to to uh to just kind of stretch the debate out long enough to be able to understand what it was that we were looking at and and as you pointed out reading legislation is difficult on on good dates and understanding how it applies um you know government lawyers take a long time to ensure that they understand how the the wording and the language uh in the in the bill impacts the outcome of it and um we as the op opposition critics were given uh, just a matter of a few days and so we did what we could to try to draw the debate out and the discussion out for as long as we could but um you know to understand what the full scope of it is and there was a question in the in here about the 20-year uh housing needs forecast as an example i've got <laughs> i mean there's so many ways for me to get into this conversation with you but there's some questions here and one of them around this uh you know i ha have the broader question to achieve what right um you can have a 20-year forecast what do you and i guess this is what the what you know what we're waiting for from the government is to see what they're going to do but the long-term demographic trends and how that's going to be informing this 20-year housing forecast do you have any sense of of what that looks like and how because uh, you know i think it is one of those pieces that will then drive the OCP and, and the what our communities look like here and across the province for the next two decades. Yeah, um, I, I have to say, no, I really don't have an idea of what they're going to do with that. Um, if I had to guess, I think they're going to simply talk about a total number of units rather than this many non-market and this many market and uh the reason i say that is it's um it's it's very difficult if you look at you know say sydney's downtown and say this parcel is the right one for affordable this one's the right one for rental whereas normally what happens is you know the market will come forward and say i've got a project i'm interested in doing this and uh to, yeah, it, so I, I think it would be, it'll be challenging if, uh, if they do say more than simply a number of units. And if all they do is say a number of units, then you're back to the problem we currently face, which is that the majority of them are going to be um, targeting uh, people downsizing, retired people moving from somewhere else. You know, it, it'll be, um, perpetuating the problem we've been seeing. So I'm not sure there's an easy way out. Of this. No. Um, the other, so the other piece that's a, that is a trigger point here is, has nothing, well, it's, it's the accessibility of transit. Mm -hmm. I've, yeah. and there are advocate, many advocates on the Sandwich Peninsula that are, have been calling for a, a rapid bus system to be created to connect the, you know, the airport and the ferry with, with uh, Uptown. And so we saw the first, um, uh, I guess, just in, in the context of your presentation, this is not something that's happening now, but I feel like the, the pr province with the investment at Mount Newton, uh, the investments that have, the first investment that happened at Sayward, I think we're on track to, to building out a rapid bus system, which I think in that context, some of the, even just a plan for that, as yeah. soon as they articulate a plan for it, as you mentioned, it, it yeah. changes yeah. substantively this presentation and, and well, it changes to a point this presentation. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it, that to me is one of the really key things here is that um, suddenly we recognize that transit planning, long-term transit planning uh, is going to have significant land use implications for us. It's not, you know, that you should try to make the housing around the, the transit to make it more efficient or whatever, but you're required to. So, you know, these TOA rules kick in. 
the minute we have a plan. It could be, it could be a 10 year plan and it, it'll trigger it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'd like to see, you know, the BC, the Transit Act get amended so that um, every municipality on the peninsula has a rep. It's really fundamental. It, well, absolutely. It's going to be necessary. I think there's going to be, a, there's going to need to be a, a different governance structure for the trans a transportation commission governance structure change. Um, to be honest, they should think about, um, should they just stop that and give it all to CRD? Because they're doing the regional planning anyway. But anyway, that that's a, they did not think this out and governance right now is not fair. The governance at the local government level just changed dramatically. The role of a municipal councillor is dramatically different, I, I think, today than it was before in, in the sense that there was a focus, uh, there, there was a requirement for local government to look at the industrial, the commercial, and and the residential. The residential has largely been removed from that, and now it's to me, it's going to be a much greater focus on for local governments on trying to deliver the services to the potentially you know increased population and making sure that the infrastructure is in place in order to be able to support that growth, because with that residential growth will come necessarily some commercial and some industrial growth to support it. So what's your that's just kind of a crude assessment of what might has changed might have changed for a local government. What's your sense of that? I um I I don't think the role of a counselor has changed that much. Um the there is a there's a change of focus in the That's... the OCP has suddenly become a lot more important and the zoning bylaw less so because the zoning bylaw must match your OCP. So Sydney's got a lot of um, multifamily uh, residential zones, condos, apartments, townhomes, not the single family stuff, but roughly, um, wow, 60%, let's say of Sydney is, is in that single family gonna get affected. And okay, um, suddenly you, maybe I'm allowed to do four units on my lot, not maybe, I will be. But um, that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. And where they've made these changes before, that doesn't mean you're going to have an instant uptake, um, particularly right. where you have issues about servicing and things like that, because that is the best reason for, that is a legitimate reason for slowing it down. The thing is, I, I, so um, counselors don't spend time on single family development anyway. Like you, you, Normally you apply for a building permit unless you need a variance. You need a variance, you still got to come to council. Um, so that hasn't changed. What will have changed is um, the amount of effort that goes into an OCP because we all realize that that's going to immediately translate into zoning changes, right? And uh, updating an OCP is already a pretty big you know, process this just kind of adds to it uh, from what I can see. Well, there's frequency for requirements of updating your 20 year uh, housing right. needs forecast. And there's, I think a requirement now to increase the frequency at which you review your official community plan. I guess partly the what's informing the official community plan is coming from outside the community rather than from generated because there were those conditions around the, the transportation uh the transit piece that there are some influences from the outside on on what your official community plan is going to be required that the methodology that they're going to use for the housing needs forecast as an example yeah well there are um there's a bunch of technical stuff they have not rolled out but you know when you look at an ocp like sydney's ocp how much population does that represent, right? So if I amend it and I do X, Y, and Z, how do I figure out what the new population is because of that? Well, you know, it's easy when you say it's one residential unit and, and then you kind of go, StatsCan says one residential unit is 2.1 people on average. 
But what do you do when it's a um, thousand uh, square feet of floor area? How many residents is that? And uh, okay, the province is going to give us some rules on how to calculate all that stuff. Oh, will it be different from the way we do it now? I have no idea. Like they, they yet to come. One of the, uh, there's an article in the CBC today about the lack of planners. You, you mentioned this in your, in your presentation. This was something that uh, as the conversation about the incoming bills, this is prior to the fall when they were, before they were tabled, uh, I was hearing from local governments. I was, when we go to the Union of BC Municipalities, we hear local governments are having a hard time uh, getting the full complement of staff that they need in order to be able to to do this. It's it's not a surprise by the province. They put $51 million, I think, on the table in order to support municipalities with, I mean, some of these costs will be offset by that. It'll be interesting to see how if that's enough or how much that, that fund is going to be used. Um, but th this, uh, you know, one of the concerns that you raised that I think is really legitimate, and that is the ability to to actually meet these timelines, just based on the the capacity of the industry to be able to support the massive amount of changes that are going to be required. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's quite a bit of work involved in making the changes to the bylaws that are going to be necessary, and you know, figuring out that kind of detail. And there's a limited pool of consultants that you can, you know, that are available that you can draw on. And like you say, even hiring planners. Central Saanich and their meeting on Monday, their uh, staff recommendation was that they were going to hire a contract planner for 18 months to help them deal with the workload. So hopefully they can find somebody. Yeah, hopefully they all can find somebody. Um, all right, so let's get to a few of the questions that are here. Um, I think we've, we've responded to a few of them, sort of, and we've kind of touched on them. Uh, John Evans asked a question of what happens about the next election. As uh, Peter pointed out, uh, the the reality these bills are are law. There's timelines, and they've been regulated, so it doesn't matter what. I mean, it's always up. You know, a new government can come in and change the laws, just like the BC NDP created these laws. A new government, a different brand, could come in and change it, uh, but these are the current laws. Any further comment to that, Peter? Or? No, you, you know, you're dead on on that. I mean, new government, my easiest thing would be perhaps extending a timeline, but um, it'll be very easy for them to say, you know, we inherited this, it's, you know, we have to live with it. Um, so, John, uh, there's a question here uh, about, um, here, I'll just read it out. One or more than one municipality, workforce commuters are largely list are, uh, lost in the current process. Given transit and housing needs impacts on this new set of laws, how can we improve the reflection of commuting needs reflected in planning? Um, so I think like the identifying workforce housing, the, the, the housing that was created here with this bill, Peter, is market housing. Now, I asked this question. And so the, the housing market will produce these units and they will be available on the market for what the market i guess produces them at um so this i think fits into the comment that you made that we're largely going to be where we're at today which is the housing market producing the houses at the current price and to target workforce housing or something like that it's still going to require some kind of an intervention i think in order to get the the affordability that at least some demographics, some people are going to need in order to be able to live on the on the peninsula. This bill doesn't in and of itself necessarily mean that there's going to be an increase in housing affordability uh, for the workforce to just stay out here on the Saanich Peninsula and work in our industrial park, say, for an example. Yeah, this is, um, that's a complicated question. And I guess the, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to weasel out of answering it, but the thing is, we're still waiting for them to give us a lot of the critical details on, you know, what's the methodology for the housing needs report. They haven't designated any of these tier four things. Are they going to, um, you know, there's stuff that we don't know 
So <laughs> it would be incredibly speculative for me to comment on how that's going to affect affordability for workforce or anything else. I mean, you know, the, yeah, <laughs> it, it really, it, it will just be very speculative. So, you know, they put out that modeling report on uh, how it was going to affect things. And that's based on a ton of assumptions. And are they going to put all those assumptions in a regulation and drop it in front of us over the next couple of months? Or I have no idea. And, and you know, so um, I, I have talked to some developers and uh, there is some thought that when the full thing is implemented and it's rolled out two years from now, that it, it should reduce um, the cost of development approvals, which should have a ripple effect of um, reducing you know, costs. But that won't be the case for the single family because it doesn't have a development approval process now. So you can't reduce that cost anymore. Um, and you know, if, if my single family lot can suddenly allow four units, um, the market says uh, my lot just got more value. And I don't know to what extent, um, but that oh. one, I, I, yeah, I, I get, I, I think I'm, I would, my opinion kind of matches that I think that's what's going to happen on the single family. But if we're talking townhomes and, and condos and apartments, and, you know, workforce housing often is the apartment kind of form or the townhouse form, maybe in a couple of years that will make some difference. We can, uh, we can talk real estate market economics in another forum. That's not really the focus that you've done, kind of dragged dragged it into it here a little bit, but it, it is a it is a big part of it, and and how this a big part in the debate that I brought into it was the impact that um, w when you have single property owners and multiple property owners, and and the multi generational impact that that has in comparison to people who are born into families that are not property owners, and there's some really important economics there that we need to be cognizant of because there's a 1.5 million renters in British Columbia they're not they're most of those are non-property -prop owners and what impact does this law have on them and I, I think that that there is a worthwhile conversation just a different uh voices of Saanich <laughs> so let's yeah. go back to the questions here Peter um and I, I appreciate you bringing the expertise here to uh the actual technical aspects of, of what's happening here so um I'm going to get back into it. I think, uh, as you've said, this does not impact the uh, Southern Gulf Islands and the Islands Trust uh, currently, uh, and un unlikely in, in any short-term uh, piece, but certainly it, it sits outside it now, correct? Yep. Yeah, there's a very clear, it does not apply on Island Trust land. Um, thank you. Okay, so Michael asked a question, uh, if a transit authority planned a new bus route with a 14 minute service versus a 16 minute service, it sounds like that affects the development potential of all lots within 200 meters. 400, but yes. 400 meters. Yeah. So a, a two minute uh, transit difference has a dramatic, or a, some impact anyways on on whether they're going to be considered for these bills or, or not these new laws yeah yeah it like i say the 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 transit plans become very important in terms of what they mean for um uh, for you know development and density so i want to talk about reasonable here and unreasonable for just a second because so I was in a committee meeting, uh, one of it was uh, the uh, freedom of information or protection of information. Anyway, uh, one of these special committees that I that I sit on to review the act. And uh, on that was uh, Andrew Wilkinson, the former leader of the BC Liberals. And we got into this conversation about, well, who's determining what's reasonable and what's unreasonable? And being the lawyer that he was, he stepped in and he said, surely we... <laughs> 
we have a legal definition of what's reason. And so it's, it's actually a legally defined thing. And it, it often gets these conversations hung up because it's like, well, who's determining reasonable and unreasonable. And as you pointed out, the court def has defined reasonable and what's unreasonable. And um, this is something that we do fairly confidently, I think in our, in the courts. Uh, and if, it's unfortunate that, you know, we might be creating a situation where we're increasing the, the opportunity for the courts to determine whether something's reasonable or unreasonable, but that, that is the outcome. And, and largely when we're taking a look at it, I think our bureaucracies understand and are able to define it as well. So I just thought that I'd mention that. Yeah, no, um, definitely. It's totally by court precedent. Another thing too, around this, and, and it's in kind of an interesting nuanced piece, but I think that it, 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 it highlights some, some of the aspects of the way that they brought these uh, forward. So current heritage designations, yep. they can't change. Or, you know, they, they, you, they can remain in place. Sorry, I should put it that way. Yep. They can remain in place. But this really significantly limits future heritage designations. Um, no. Uh, you can't do it unreasonably. So if if I tried to put a heritage designation on a property that had no just, you know, no heritage value at all, and I'm doing it solely to make it difficult to do the three or four or six units, um, I can't do that. But if, um, if I'm looking at a, a, a bona fide heritage property that we simply have not designated yet, um, for the sake of argument, uh, well, no, Deacon Wharf's not a residence, but um, there are plenty of ones around that um, you know are significant, um, <laughs> federal history or whatever, that that are not designated yet. Um, Sydney probably has several, and North Central Saanich um, designated a couple of uh, properties at the owner's request only a couple of years ago. So I mean, it it, it can happen. Um, there's no barrier to doing it as long as you're doing it for legitimate heritage reasons. But um, as long as you're doing it for a legitimate heritage reason. So identifying places with indigenous for, of indigenous heritage, for an example. So the central Saanich slope uh, on Mount Newton, for any, you know, on the other side of the, the south side of Mount Newton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wow. So, you know, you can do a heritage designation for an area like Chinatown. And in fact, in doing something, and, and Oak Bay has got an area that's um, got a designation um, as the neighborhood, not the individual buildings. And it's a kind of a foreign character thing. So there are heritage designations that can be done like that. Um, what they're saying is, you can't do that for the purposes of blocking the four units. So you might say um, minimize the lot coverage, but you can still do four units with a maximum of 11 meters and so on. And you know the heritage designation or agreement is gonna have conditions about minimizing uh, lot coverage and the site disturbance and and sight lines and I don't know what all the stuff would be, but you can do something like that with us, you know, and, and still say, and on these single family lots, you can still do four units. You just minimize that lot coverage, you know, whatever, right? So it's not a complete barrier, but it makes it a little more complicated. And the other thing it does is it opens up the door for the property owner to go you're being unreasonable about this. I want a court to do a judicial review of your decision. Yeah, and I and I would say that it pigeonhole it, the, it has the potential of cornering us into doing heritage designations that we've always done, and not considering uh, um, heritage designations from an, an indigenous perspective. Let's just say, for an example, because recognizing a sacred site and saying that. You know, then we're basically taking it to the court and saying, is it unreasonable to say that certain places, right? So anyway, I just, this is one that around heritage designations got, yeah, I remember sitting on Central Saanich Council when we were, you know, when, when there were 
a certain type of heritage designation that was made and, and others were, were not. So anyway, I just, it just um, want to make sure that as we look, especially in, with reconciliation, that, that we're able to preserve some of these spaces that are recognized as sacred spaces without these bills negatively impacting them, I guess was the, yeah. what I was raising. So I, okay. I think it makes it more complicated, um, but I don't think it totally rules it out. The other thing it makes more complicated, um, like Sydney's got a lot of, uh, has, has designated environmentally sensitive areas in its OCP, got guidelines, you know, and, and they, they will continue even after Bill 44 kicks in to the extent that they don't interfere, right? For North Saanich, which is going through its OCP process and thinking about creating environmentally sensitive areas, so these didn't exist in advance of the legislation, suddenly it's a lot more complicated because now you have to look at, am I being reasonable? How does this relate to the policy manual? And all that kind of good stuff. Um, I think you have to be more cautious about it as a municipality, and that generally means it costs more. How does this impact waterfront setback requirements? It it doesn't. Um, Bill forty four does not affect setbacks. Period. Okay, they've got a policy manual where they recommend what the numbers might look like, but they don't actually change any of the setbacks in your existing zoning, okay? So that's one of the things that a municipality will be looking at when they do their zoning bylaw update. Should we make some changes? There's nothing that compels them to. Okay. Um, here's a, uh, envir an environmental and a, and a um, geographic uh, question just with respect to the carrying capacity of of the land, uh, the ability to sustain uh, through uh, food security. Basically, these bills are focused just on housing, um, but uh, you know the, the impacts on the watershed and the water supply, um, food sustainability in the CRD, uh, the impact on the landfill um, is another example of this. I think you can you know you can add into well. Let, let's just leave it at that because let's leave it at the environmental perspective. I asked the question whether or not there was an analysis done on the urban tree canopy as an example of, of Vancouver or of the Capital Regional District, what the potential of of more um, lot coverage, you know, what the potential impacts of that could be and and then the rights that are given the developer to cut trees and replace them with, with newly planted trees as an example. So uh, do you want... Can you do you have any impact any thoughts on what the impact on the environment are with respect to both our ability to the natural services and then as well the impact on the uh, on trees etc. So this is something they actually talk about in that um, in that uh, policy manual for the small scale multi unit and they're of the view that the municipalities should be able to manage. The development approvals uh, in a manner that um, essentially preserves the tree canopy because you're not doing 100% uh, lot coverage so you have some flexibility where trees can go and stuff like that that's the response in the policy manual um, in practice um, you know more floor area more density uh, usually translates to more lot coverage, more driveway, um, you know, and, and living area, outside living area like patios and stuff. That is, um, that, that doesn't work very well at trying to preserve tree canopy. Like increasing density and preserving tree canopy is really challenging. So most of the, a lot of the efforts are to mitigate the loss are, uh, planting trees elsewhere on boulevards and public property and all that kind of stuff to make up for it, um, but not necessarily right on the development. Where, um, where we have significant uh, tree stands in Sydney, um, those are actually defined in uh, environmentally sensitive areas, like the Beaufort Road area 
is specifically to preserve that buffer growth. And they discourage subdivision and um, they encourage um, flexibility on setbacks, et cetera, for the sake of preserving trees and it's all laid out in the guidelines. Um, so there, there are some tools that a municipality can use to to try to address the, that topic, but you know the simple answer: more density generally means less trees. Replacing a mature tree with a newly planted tree in a boulevard is not equivalent. It's not the same thing. So you know, no. I think that the. The, that this was one of those moments in which I I was quite frustrated be, at, in the debate because the the reality of you know the heat dome that we experienced just a few summers ago is an example anywhere where there was a tree canopy or there was a, a mature tree canopy in a community was the safest place to go frankly uh, under out of the sun and anyway. Um, I won't disagree with that, but an important thing for urban uh, forestry is you, you've got to regenerate the trees. You can't let them over mature um, because what happens is when they eventually go, and they will, um, you have this huge gap in the canopy. and You've got nothing coming up to replace it, where if you keep that rolling trend, you know, planning program going, you're, you have new trees coming up new canopy you've got oh, uh, yeah not disputing that at all i'm not disputing that i'm i'm just suggesting that if if the if the tree canopy is coming down in now new developable areas like like this bill creates anyway yeah. uh that's yeah okay um so there is a question here from Oh, the question about what will happen if municipalities decide to not implement these rules. Um, I, we're, we're, <laughs> seeing, we're seeing a number of, of different boards and uh, the Metro Vancouver board had an in-camera discussion about this. C Sydney, Central Sanders is having discussions about this. So um, are there any municipalities that are going to refuse and what would be the recourse on the provincial government if they decided to? Um, so, you know, all the authority that a, a, a municipal council has is delegated from the province. They can literally overrule everything. Um, so if they want the zoning to look like this, they can just say, order in council, here it is, right? Minister can actually act as the, as the yes. council. Yeah, so the, the thing is that um, if anyone's going to play, you know, you can't make us do this, we're not going to do this. Um, they're probably going to find that um, somebody will do a much poorer job writing their new bylaw than they would have if they just sucked it up and did it. And I point to that um, uh, New Westminster uh, bus exchange, the one that uh, you know reaches right across the Fraser River. That's an example of the kind of quality you might get if you force their hand to overrule all right well um we've gone over time here now i'm gonna this seems like a good place to end it thank you peter for for uh, this good discussion and for your presentation it was uh, greatly appreciated this evening and uh, i hope that people go away from this conversation with uh deeper knowledge of of the bills that were passed this uh, past fall and um just i guess what to keep your eye on do you have any final comments and then i'll invite tex back into the room and close us down in a good way here yeah um one thing i was going to do i mentioned that the um slide deck was available for anyone who wanted it i have just posted it in the chat um and uh you can if you want a copy of it uh go to the chat click on the link and just download it awesome Thank you. And uh, I'll, well, I'll make a I'll make a uh, a pitch here as we provide these uh, these events free of charge. And I should have mentioned this earlier, and it's in the comments. If uh, if you're moved to do so, we just ask that you make a, a contribution to the Sanitary Peninsula Food Bank. 
And there's a link also in the chat there uh, as well. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Good luck in your um, in your presentation on Sunday. I hope it goes as smoothly as uh, it went today. And I really appreciate the uh, the uh, insights that you provided us. And I'll turn it over to Tex. Um, once again, let me thank you, Peter. M much appreciated to help us try and understand this complicated and really, really, uh, uh, this is impactful. And, uh, and we appreciate you taking the time to help us sort through that. I just wanted this to, in addition to thanking you, let folks know that we're in discussion right now with um, Bryony e. Penn and, uh, and a couple other folks, one from Victoria and one from uh, uh, up north in the Gulf Islands up north. Uh, the Northern Islands, and uh, they're working to set up a, her uh, a herring conservation and restoration group. And um, we've been talking with them about coming in to join Adam. They've got a film that they've made, and um, we've got a tentative date of March 14. So we'll keep you posted on that one. Um, we thank Bryony for helping us put that together, and we'll look forward to sharing that with you in the coming weeks. And Adam, I think I'm basically done. Thank you. Right on. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, Peter, do you want to leave the, uh, there's a, a still a few more people, still a few people in the room. Do you want to tell people when the uh, Sydney conversation, when, when and where the Sydney conversation is sure. and when and where they might be able to find it on Radio Sydney? Okay. So, um, we recorded this uh, uh, session tonight, and Radio Sydney is going to put that up as a podcast. Um, probably take us a couple of days to do that, but it will be on radiosydney.ca. You'll be able to find it through there. Uh, I'll have a link to it off my Facebook page as well. That's um, Peninsula Affairs Radio Sydney, Peter Wainwright. Uh, if you're looking for it, I don't think we're too hard to find. Um, we're, we have a panel discussion happening on Sunday. It's uh, jointly hosted by the Sydney Community Association and Radio Sydney. Uh, in addition to myself, we've got uh, Jordan Milne, who's um, the CEO of GMC Projects, that he's a developer, the proponent of the Cedarwood, um, very knowledgeable on uh, affordable housing, workforce housing, that kind of stuff, but developer's perspective and we have Jarrett Matanowicz, who's the Director of Planning for Central Saanich, who will be yes. you know, giving his perspective. And he's got you know, all the knowledge of how it applies in ALR and that kind of stuff that isn't really a Sydney kind of thing. And then on February 7th, um, I'm going to be giving a talk to the North Saanich Residents Association meeting again on housing. So, and that one will be specific to North Saanich. So if you're interested in any of those, um, they're free to attend. So join the Peter Wainwright housing tour, basically. All right, thank you so much, Peter. Really appreciate uh, our conversations and uh, what you brought to the conversation tonight. Thank you so much and uh, wishing everybody well and have a good evening. Thanks for having me.